Here's a session designed to empower viewers. SDG advocates will share concrete actions to take in your own lives or advocate for in your own cities, regions, and countries in order to advance the SDGs focusing on dignity and human rights. Hello, and thank you for joining us at the SDG Action Zone. I am so excited to be with three incredible leaders today as we talk about tangible solutions that can actually transform the world. Now, I know you've heard about the SDGs a lot this week, which is what we would like, but you're probably wondering, okay, so what can I actually do? And we're here to tell you exactly that. Today, I'm joined by the incredible Jamira Burley. Feel free to say hi, Jamira. A education hi, everyone and social and civil rights activist here in the United States. Jenna Amin, a 17-year-old Egyptian-American advocate for women and girls. Hi, everyone. And Inana Lifili, Tipu Liahi, Tipu Ahi. Hello, 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 everyone. So, what our mission is today is for you to be able to walk away knowing exactly what you can do, either at a government level, business level, and even at an individual level, to really make the SDGs tangible and matter in your own community. So I'm going to start with you, Phoebe. We've heard a lot about the SDGs this week. What would you say has really stood out to you as an opportunity for progression? I would say definitely the youth engagement and um, the empowerment that we've seen in our generation, I would say that the opportunity is giving to our youth to be able to really use their voices and have an impact and have a say in the decisions that our governments and our communities make is so essential, especially as we face um, so many global issues such as climate change, such as um, racial issues and systemic issues that we have to face or not only right now, but on the coming future for our oncoming generations. I think that's really stood out to me. Okay, and Jamira, what are some points of action you think that have really, as Feely had mentioned, there's been increased youth engagement. You've been doing this work since you were 15 years old. So what is different about this moment? I think what's different about this moment is that I, I, I think there's finally an understanding of intersectionality in a much deeper way, where prior to even the SDGs, there were the sustainable development goals. And a lot of folks looked at those goals as very separate issues. And I think there's finally a conversation where people are realizing you can't solve one without solving all of them if we're really looking to cultivate and create the world that we want, especially not just for just this generation, but for future generations to come. And Jenna, as a youth advocate yourself, do you share that sentiment that this really is a moment for intersectionality, youth engagement, um, or, or do you feel like there's another opportunity for action as well? 100%. I feel like as Jamira and Philly have been saying, it's been incredible to see all the youth engagement over the past week, but I think it's definitely not enough and we need more youth to be at the decision making table, um, really informing decisions on the governmental business and even individual levels. So I think we can all do more to actively listen to youth voices. So that is the perfect segue into my next question. I'm going to ask for you to each give me a recommendation um, at each level, business, government and individual. Um, and from there, I'm hoping we can have an open discussion about what is something we can actually employ right now. What can we do that is different? So Jamira, starting with you, what is a recommendation if you are, you know, in a room with the top 500 CEOs tomorrow, what's the recommendation you give them? To stop talking. <laughs> um, and I, I deeply mean that because I think what we're seeing is not just here in the U.S., but around the world is that corporations are finally understanding that to be socially conscious, to be socially aware to in, employ those same tactics internally and externally is not just the cute thing to do, it's actually the profitable thing to do. It impacts their bottom line. And so I think you, you now see a lot of companies who and CEOs speaking out on behalf of these issues that they actually don't have a deep understanding of and they don't understand the intersectionalities. And so that's why you have CEOs talking about how they can find black talent, right? Or that they think they have an idea of the issues that are impacting women, but yet they're still perpetuating those same kind of ideologies internally within their business. And so I think the first step that CEOs, business leaders and organizations should do is to stop talking and actually start listening to not only the people that you employ, but also the communities that you're trying to impact and engage. There's something to be really said about how 
you there we can learn a lot from each other's stories, the cultural competence, and really getting a deeper understanding of the issues beyond just the statistics. And I think once we start listening, we can actually cultivate better solutions that not only impacts our bottom line, but also improves our corporate culture and improves hopefully the rest of the world. Do you have any corporations you think are on the right path? Do, are there any that you see and you're excited by? You're thinking, okay, hey, these, these people are listening. This isn't just, you know, for show. This isn't tokenization. They actually care. Or, or do you feel like we're all kind of at the starting gate? I think a lot of it is still at the starting gate, which is not a bad thing, right? I think there's something to be said about admitting that you don't know what to do or you don't have all the answers because at least we in the community can be like, okay, you're speaking from a, a level of like honesty and integrity. Um, I do think that one thing corporations should stop doing, I went to a conference recently on social impact and everyone who runs the social impact arm for these companies are oftentimes white Americans um, who come from very privileged backgrounds, women oftentimes, and, and they don't represent the communities that they're trying to influence. So I think mm -hmm. stop pulling people from your HR and your policy office to run your social impact. Those two things are not the same thing. Um, but I will say I have the pleasure of working for Sephora as their um, as an equity advisor. And what Sephora is interesting about what Sephora is doing is that they're again not saying that they have all the answers, but they have commissioned a research proposal working with. Um, activists and organizers around the country to really look at how the retail industry can be more inclusive to not just black folks, but also to folks of a range of different communities, um, a range of different um, backgrounds, ages, gender, sexuality, um, to ensure that the retail industry is being more cautious. And I think that is a first step, again, learning, then implementing and working with the people who are actually in the communities that you're trying to engage. I think that's okay. So number one recommendation we have so far is stop talking, start listening and learning from the community you are trying to impact. Feely, what's your number one recommendation for our CEOs that are all listening to this intently? My number one recommendation to our CEOs would definitely be firstly to divest from fossil fuels and to halt construction through indigenous lands. And the reason why I'm saying this is because as an indigenous person myself, indigenous people make up 5% of the world population and protect over 80% of the world's biodiversity. Um, and I think that it's really important that we acknowledge that because while we're talking about climate change, oftentimes people don't realize that indigenous people are at the forefront of that. Um, being from the Pacific, being from New Zealand, a country that is supposedly leading the fight against climate change, oftentimes I see that our own indigenous communities here in my country are often left behind and aren't considered. And that we see a lot of corporations um, not really consulting with Indigenous people when they want to take more of their land after, in a lot of cases, what has been years and centuries of systemic oppression after colonization. And so I think it's really important that we look at that um, if we are going to have a sustainable future, if we are going to meet the deadlines of cutting carbon emissions by 2030 that we made in 2018, because a lot of our countries, especially in the Pacific, simply don't have that long to wait and simply can't keep dealing with the oncoming issues that bring um, our countries and our heritage and our future generations when CEOs and corporations aren't listening, aren't consulting with these communities and are just neglecting these type of situations that are happening. So I'm hearing a lot of similarities here, the sense of actually listening to the local communities, recognizing that there are local leaders who are already doing this work and have been doing this work mm -hmm. for centuries um, and really almost showing up with humility as a company and saying, we don't know what we're doing. Can you help us? Mm -hmm. Feely, are there any companies that you feel are doing this? Are, are there any kind of North stars that, that you feel are really kind of putting their, their actions where their mouths are? Or do you feel like similar to Jamira, we're all kind of still at the starting line? I feel like when it comes to respecting and consulting with our indigenous communities, we are definitely just at the starting line. Um, Cause I think that there aren't enough companies that are actually leading the way and talking to other companies about how to, how to be able to make a future fit um, way for the rest of the world and really for the rest of their peers. Um, and I definitely feel like there are too many indigenous communities that are having to go up against these multimillionaire corporations when they come from, um, you know, systemically oppressed communities where they may be coming from low socioeconomic backgrounds, they may not have the structural support that they need to be able to fight for pretty much the earth and our environment. And it's really sad that we see in a lot of the climate activists, climate activist spaces, that their voices are drowned out by almost like white saviors, um, people who are definitely not listening 
to those who are directly affected, but instead speaking from a place of privilege. And I think that's something that definitely has to be looked at. Thank you. If that. I can jump in. Go, go right ahead. No, I saw I you. You're on the edge of your seat. I'm going to let you. Go ahead. As soon as she said white saviors, I'm just like, ah, oh, yes. Can we please move away from white savior complex? Like, you don't have all the answers. You can have compassion. You can have I, great ideas. But if you're not actually listening to the community members, you could be doing real harm because you're oftentimes coming from a westernized perspective, trying to tell communities how to live their lives and also what justice and what freedom looks for, like for them them, which I think is extremely harmful and only continues to perpetuate um, a very white facing ideology about how the rest of the world should be living, which to be honest, has not worked. <laughs> it just hasn't. Well, I mean, it has worked for some. It, yeah, the most privileged and oftentimes the most um, Caucasian of us all, but yes. Okay. Yep. So I, we are actually going to come back to this because I do think, um, I do think the history of oppression and I think what's happening in the world today is an incredibly important point to talk about when we're saying, okay, these are tangible actions for the SDGs, um, especially as it relates to governments. But I wanna give Jenna a second here to come in on her recommendation to businesses. Yeah, I think among businesses, there's this belief that diversity is inclusivity and it simply is not. And so like Jamira and Freely were saying, Companies need to be listening and actively seeking out, you know, this diverse pipeline. Um, I've heard so many people tell me, Jenna, 33 um, of Fortune 500 companies are run by women. And I'm like, that is not a good statistic. You should not be sharing that with me, right? And especially if these women are not being given the same voice and respect that their male counterparts are. So I think as much as possible, we need to be, you know, welcoming minority groups in the business space and actively seeking out and supporting them because otherwise um, we're not going to have inclusive work environments and that's going to have you know really negative repercussions on the communities that these companies are supposed to be serving so to sum this up correct me if i'm wrong at all but i'm hearing that first and foremost we really need to stop talking and start listening to our local communities particularly local indigenous communities and the communities that we're trying to have most impact on as corporations. Second to that, we have to ensure that the people working within the organization and company look like the people that we are trying to serve out of the organization and company. It just does not make sense to only have one subset of the population that has no knowledge or con contextual awareness attempting to serve a subset of the population that has expertise and has incredible leadership. And of course, above and beyond all of that divesting of fossil fuels and making sure that your production lines are as are legitimate and are as authentic as the press releases you put out um, and really maintaining that in environmental uh, integrity. So did that sum our recommendations to corporations up effectively? Would we yes. like to add anything else? Yes, eliminate white savior culture. <laughs> And number four, eliminate white savior culture. So we're now going to go to our recommendations for governments. And all three of you have so far mentioned something that, uh, you know, I think has been a headline of 2020, rightly so. Um, and I do think we'll continue to be until we can actually create some sort of justice and some sort of, um, yeah, some sort of, of, of recognition. Um, of, of historical injustice. And that is the oppression of particular groups of people. Um, Feely, you've spoken about indigenous people in New Zealand. Uh, Jamira, you've spoken about black Americans. Uh, the reality that they, they face unique disadvantage um, and are now currently, a lot of companies, a lot of governments are talking about working with them and supporting them, but that hasn't necessarily happened. Now, in the SDGs, we talk about reducing inequalities, we talk about gender equality, but we also talk about opportunities for education and for economic growth and employment. And, and the reality is, one of my, I feel, one of the most important SDGs in my view is peace, justice, and strong institutions, because it enables citizens to truly believe in their governments and to truly believe that their governments have their best interests. So if you were going to give recommendations to governments on the SDGs and saying, listen, this is an unusual year. There's been COVID, we recognize you are figuring out a whole bunch of stuff you did not anticipate having to figure out, but this is what is critically important to actually be able to achieve equal and sustainable and, and prosperous outcomes for all. What would your recommendation be? And this time, Jenna, I'll start with you. 
Yeah, so I really think that as governments look towards rebuilding society and the economy post COVID-19, it's especially important that they really listen to the marginalized, vo marginalized voices that are especially vulnerable within this conflict. Um, and I think that means listening to young people, racial minorities, ethnic minorities, people of color, and I think most of all women, because women lives have been on the front lines of fighting this virus. Um, they account for nearly 70% of health workers. And yet, you know, there are gonna be 20 million fewer girls going back to school this fall. And so it's this discrepancy that I think governments really need to put um, at the helm of their work to rebuild our communities. That is, so Jenna, I have a question for you. Now, keeping in mind COVID and the realities of COVID, and you are, let's say, a head of state or a minister of education, and you have to also marry that with the reality of less girls going back to school. So you are trying to manage this crisis on both fronts. What would you do? In the position of leadership, what would your, what would your first step be? I think the first step would be recognizing that any policy that I put into place is not equally going to impact um, young boys as it is young girls. And so when we talk about technology access, for example, it's usually the sons in the family um, that get to have first and foremost access to technology. So it's providing girls with stable access to internet, um, to cellular devices, so that they can attend school virtually. Um, in terms of going back to school, it's providing families with young women um, financial support so that they can afford so that girls can go to school. So I think it's very tangible, very specific responses um, that ultimately help lift up young women. And I think that can only be done by listening to those young women in the first place. Okay, so our first recommendation is mainstreaming gender throughout all policy. So if it's, a, it's, a, if it's an education policy, recognizing that it impacts young women differently and actually resourcing for that reaching out to young women and their families and saying, okay, what is the, what, what is the challenge? Is it distance? Is it security? Um, is it finances? Is it technology? And how can we support that? So we're, we're back to that same recommendation we have for corporations, which is listen to the local community. I feel like that's going to be a uh, blanket statement recommendation across the board. Uh, but on top of that, we are saying that if you're making a policy, if it's about healthcare, if it's about food security, whatever it is about, you need to be mainstreaming gender. You need to be recognizing that women and girls are impacted differently, racial minorities are impacted differently, and that you have to consider that when implementing and resourcing that policy. Feely, how about you? I definitely feel that every government needs to be acknowledging that COVID-19 is a byproduct of climate change. And this is something that indigenous communities and communities of color have been talking about for thousands of years. You know, our communities have lived in our lands and have known how to take care of our lands for such a long time. And that is not considered enough when it comes to global and regional climate goals. And I say that because as you know, there has been a goal set that by 2030, our carbon emissions will be set, will be cut in half. And simply that is not good enough. Coming from the Pacific, knowing that our Pacific islands are at risk of sinking, it's whole countries that are at risk here. And they're countries of indigenous people, people of color, of countries that have been pillaged and destabilized by colonization, by all of these systems that are at place. And I really want to bring in what Jamila had said about intersectionality, because that's really where it counts. And I think that what all governments need to do is exactly like um, the solutions we had for corporate, working apart in partnership with corporations to make sure that we are actually consulting with indigenous communities and that all of our climate goals are in consultation with them. Um, for New Zealand, I think it's very specific because the answer to climate justice is actually constitutional transformation through honoring Te Tiriti o Waitangi, which is the Maori version of the treaty that we have. Because um, I think that a lot of the processes that we have in place, like I said, they are taking a lot longer than they should be. And although we have the frameworks, indigenous frameworks in place that could be making these solutions, they are just being overlooked and not used at all. Um, so with that, even the indigenous communities that live in diaspora, New Zealand having the biggest Pacifica diaspora in the world, it needs to be looked at. We have countries, the United Nations has acknowledged that Tuvalu, a Pacific Island country, is the most affected by climate change right now. And there's a big risk that a lot of our countries will already be underwater by the time 2030 comes. So I definitely think that's the solution that our governments need to be looking at. So Philly, 
I have a question. I was um, born and raised in Canada and uh, the treatment of First Nations people there and Indigenous people there mm. um, has been devastating and, and continues to be devastating. And I don't think, I can personally not think of a single country um, that has respected and um, afforded due justice to its Indigenous communities. Mm. And I, I wonder, what is your, where are you finding hope you know, 2030 is very close. And you're, you are talking about entire countries being wiped off the map due to climate change. And the recognition that for centuries, governments and corporations have not respected, heard, and exa the exact or First Nations people and the exact opposite. They have deliberately um, committed genocide and they have deliberately ignored and they have deliberately undercut and undermined. And so my question for you is, where do you as a young indigenous climate change activist find find promise find hope find find the belief that they will do better i find the belief and the hope in definitely our communities and our leaders who are out here doing the work who are out here doing the work that the governments are not doing who are doing more work than they should be because of the lack of action from our governments and i definitely think that all indigenous people are connected all oppression is connected um again intersectionality and Indigenous communities, it has to be realized, Indigenous communities are vulnerable because they are deliberately targeted, because people profit off our pain, off our oppression, off the fact that, that we have been, like I said, privileged and uh, not privileged, pillaged <laughs> and systematically oppressed throughout all of history. And I think that it is a very, it brings in the mental health of a lot of our Indigenous children. You know, it is very traumatizing to be thinking about the potential death of your own culture, of your own homeland, especially in a country that is westernized and does not see you, someone in diaspora, as a valuable citizen um, who don't give you the justice and the peace that you deserve. And I definitely think this is where countries need to think really long and hard about who are they're living behind when they make these decisions. Who is the most vulnerable? Who is at the bottom line? That should be at the forefront of your decisions always. And I think when governments work from that place, so many more decisions will be they will just fall into place and it'll make things a whole lot easier for our vulnerable communities, definitely. So I'm hearing a lot of similarities there with Jenna in really looking at who is most impacted in the community um, and mainstreaming policies to ensure that they have that lens. So, and Jenna, Jenna gave the example of gender equality. You are speaking about the expertise and importance of recognizing the unique impacts on indigenous peoples um, and the importance of really looking, go right ahead. Yeah, because I definitely feel that um, the actual science and the knowledge that Indigenous communities have are very, very essential into looking at ways for climate justice and climate solutions. Um, like we have said, Indigenous people, they know the land. Um, because they know the land, they know the solutions and how to actually halt um, climate emergencies and climate issues from happening um, like we have seen with aboriginals and first nations people in australia with the fires that had happened there are so many different examples throughout this world that really needs to be looked at and the elders that we have in our communities must be included in these conversations and actually put at the forefront so it's actually recognizing the legitimacy of expertise and knowledge and saying that while it might not seem as what governments would see as traditional they didn't necessarily go to school for this, they actually have a lot more superior knowledge because they've lived the land, they know it, um, and they know the outcome. So it's not only listening to those local communities, but it's ensuring that they are architecting the policies. And, and I appreciate that, Billy. Uh, Jamira, what would your recommendation be for governments? It's, it's so interesting because I think what has happened over the last few months and years is a one, a, a, almost a regression of all the progress that has been made both socially, economically, and um, gender in, gender equality wise. All of that has been erased in the last few months and only has been escalated by COVID-19. Um, and what is showing is that the governments have not been prepared oftentimes to deal with the harsh realities of how we have treated both our land, but also our people. And so one of the recommendations I would give is this idea of like, what is collective impact, collective caring and collective responsibility? So the idea that we are collectively working together to look both internally within our countries, but also externally. So how are we treating our people? How are we, 
protecting our land? And how is that escalating externally for how we are making decisions that doesn't harm other communities beyond our own borders? Um, and then collective responsibility, us actually caring about what happens to communities that don't look like us, um, right? Or that don't, that we might never actually, people we may never actually meet, but they are a part of our collective humanity. And so I think we have to get to a place where governments promote this idea that it's not just about for example, American first, but also humans first, like, right? It's women first. It's like, how do we cultivate communities of caring um, that sees beyond their own individual success, but also think about how we can cultivate communities that are welcoming to all folks where are, wherever they are in the world. Um, it's so interesting that uh, Feely mentioned climate change and the idea that there are literally countries and communities that are gonna be underwater in less than a decade. I read an article that talked about how Africa may become two continents um, because of the split within it, within the continent. And so, so it's just it's mind boggling the damage we've we've made because of our own selfish greed. And I think that we have to return to a, a moment where governments are bringing folks from both the community, both corporate, both private sector intellectuals together to think about how can we create solutions that are going to improve not only our individual countries or our individual communities, but the world at large. And it has to also be governments working together um, beyond their own, again, selfish promotion and greed. And I, and I say this as an American, unfortunately. <laughs> I have a question for you guys. Before we get to what we would recommend to individuals um, in order to make tangible impact on the SDGs, I'm going to push back just a little bit. Okay. So I'm we're here to push all, back. Yeah. We're hearing all week, all these governments talking about, we do listen to our local communities. We are about human, you know, about, about the person that's left behind, you know, leave no one behind is, is a quote of the SDGs. So they're all saying what you're saying to be fair, right? My question for you is if governments have a four-year mandate and they're trying to get reelected and corporations are working on a quarterly return cycle and they need to appease shareholders, what are the specific recommendations you can give where they don't get to use buzzwords, where they don't say we are all about equality and diversity and inclusion? What are the specific metrics we can judge them by to say, yeah, but you're not because you have X percentage of employees that are actually minorities or you have, what, what are the, how can we hold them accountable is what I'm asking. Yeah. Well, what I will say is that even those percentages to um, Jenna's point earlier doesn't actually mean inclusion. So that's not even a good bar to measure on. I think what we as a culture has to redefine what success looks like, right? For elected officials, it shouldn't be about getting reelected. It should be about how are you personally improving the conditions of the countries, the communities you oversee versus like being reelected and creating these buzzwords. And also for corporations, it's not, it shouldn't be about how much more money you're making for your shareholders because what we're actually seeing since the 2008 crash is that CEOs were making massive bonuses even when their companies were trash. So <laughs> I think we have to reevaluate what success looks like. So my recommendation would be, would actually be is that um, show me your bottom line. Are you actually making the investments, right? So we know governments say that they invest in education, but oftentimes it's less than 10% of the GDP while they're investing 30 to 40% in 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 um, in and military, right? So that is actually not showing that your investment is representative of the words that you project, especially when we know military budgets do not create peace. It's oftentimes increased war around the world. So reevaluating how we're actually investing those dollars in a way that actually creates the world we say we wanna create. Thank you. I was genuinely hoping we would start talking about budgets because I think where you put your money shows what you think matters. At the check. Uh, yeah, and, and honestly, it's great to talk about mainstreaming. In my view, it's great to talk about mainstreaming gender equality or ensuring that indigenous uh, voices are architects of policies. But all of that does actually um, take resources and, and it actually does need to show intention. And um, I, can, I can honestly say I've heard a lot of governments and corporations talk about their commitments, but very rarely are those commitments resourced. And, and can you actually measure it based on what they've put into it? So, so I appreciate you mentioning that. I think it's a good bar for governments and corporations to, to be held to. So my, you know, we have about 15 minutes and I wanna make sure I'm giving us enough time to be talking to the thousands of individuals that are watching. You are all um, advocates for social change uh, for, and, and, and on various issues, um, on social justice, climate change, um, girl and women equality. And I wonder, 
and you all have come at it from different avenues. So if you are speaking to somebody like you, uh, a young 17 year old girl um, who does not uh, currently work on the SDGs or Jamira um, speaking to somebody like you, someone who is passionate about education but doesn't necessarily think there's a point of inflection for them in the SDGs. What do you recommend to them? How do they get involved? What do they do? Do they need to go and research all of the SDGs? Do they, do they need to go sign up to work at the UN? What, what, yeah. what does someone need to do to make an impact uh, on the SDGs or in their, in their local community? And Feely, I'm gonna start with you. Well, as a 17 year old that comes from a low income background, that comes from an area which is perceived to be um, connotated with crime and violence and all the things that they happen to connotate indigenous, brown and black communities with, I think it's really important to acknowledge that individualist action shouldn't be elitist and it shouldn't be based off monetary value. I think that's really important because coming in as a climate change activist, a lot of the time the individual action we see is based on how much money you can give. You know, going vegan, having an electric car, all of these individual individual actions actually don't change as much as systemic change um, does. And so I think for, for youth like me, it's important to know that just because you can't give money doesn't mean you can't give and make a change. And I would say that things that you could do no matter where you live, firstly, learn whose indigenous land you're on. Secondly, make sure you know what's happening in that community, make sure you know how you can help, how you can give back. Um, personally, being from South Auckland, being from Mangere, I live on Tainui land, which is um, Māori community, Iwen Hapu, and we recently had last year a situation where Ihumata had been occupied by a corporation which wanted to, to literally build buildings on ancestral burial grounds. And I think our community really came together during that time. And it's important to make sure that you're standing up for your indigenous people, especially when they're having to go against corporations, governments, you need to know where you stand, um, especially as people of color living as a settler in land that may not be yours. Um, and even just learning your own indigenous roots, learning where you place yourself and how you are affecting the indigenous people around you is so, so important. And so I think that definitely having the respect for the indigenous people of your country is really important in making sure that our goals for climate change and our goals for racial inequality and our goals for things to do with education, health equality, all of it's connected and it definitely starts from there. So I would recommend that. Thank you for that, Feely. I wholeheartedly, you know, I, I, will, I will say one thing um, about the power of an individual. Feely, it is what time in New Zealand right now? It is currently, wow, let me check. 3.20 a.m. 3.20 a.m. And you have exams this week, right? Yes. Yeah. And you are on this call uh, dedicated to this beyond all measure. And so I think if there's anything that can show the power of an individual and, and I think the impact an individual can have on their community and on being a voice for their community, I think that's it. So I, I genuinely so appreciate um, you being here, and I appreciate that comment because I think it's very difficult for us to talk about progression if we don't talk about the history of the land and of the people um, that that a lot of what we consider success has been built on. Uh, Jenna, I'm going to the second 17-year-old on the panel, uh, what do you think? Yeah, so I think this is especially true for you know young people, but since they are kind of the future of our worlds, but I think it's so important to recognize that your voice does have power and that your silence is like legitimately complicity. And so when you are not speaking up in moments, you know, um, of conflict or tension, whether it's at your school, whether it's at the workplace, um, that is directly hurting and harming another individual. And I think you really need to take like a second look at that and think about, you know, in terms of your advocacy work, in terms of your activist work, are you directing the attention towards yourself or are you directing it to um, communities who really need it? So make sure you're amplifying the voices of others before putting yourself first, I think. That is, and it, it brings us back to our initial comment, I think Jameer's initial comment really about centering those most impacted and not coming in as a savior. So Jameer, I'm gonna turn to you. How do you think individuals can make, and, and really tangible actions, what could I do today? in my house, in my community to help? Well, I'm happy you didn't reference my age when you turned to me, because I used to be 17 when, the, once upon a time. Um, <laughs> but what I will say, though, is that um, it's interesting that 
you know, we're at this inflection moment of so much like heightened heightened awareness and consciousness. And the thing that I, the message that I would give to a young person is, well, actually before I get to young people, it's, it's interesting you mentioned the UN, because I think if the UN, an institution that oftentimes cultivate these spaces, want to engage more is pay young people, invite young people into those spaces, elevate young people. They don't need to have a PhD to sit at the, the decision-making table. So I'll say that. And then I'll say for young people who are trying to figure out, is there a space for them? Everyone, I think, if they believe in social justice, if they, if they believe in human rights, regardless of where they are in the world, they are actually working on the SDGs, even if it's not at an official capacity. We all play a role in the success of our communities and the success of the world. And so what I will say is that if you're nervous about whether or not you are old enough, if you have enough money, if you have the right title, every movement in history has been led by young people. There is not an age requirement to save the world. There is not amount of money required to save the world. You can do something as small from your own home as just having an uncomfortable conversation with your family members or standing up and organizing a walkout at your school or raising money for someone in your community who may be um, down on their luck because of the financial implications of COVID-19. So there are li little um, actions that folks can take that actually can build up to large scale impact. And it doesn't always have to be organizing the march or being in front of the podium. Uh, we all have a role to play. And so I think it's really important for young people to figure out what are the issues they care about? How do they wanna show up and taking action regardless of where they are in the world or whatever title they may have at the moment. So I have a question for y'all and this is more personal curiosity than anything else. We often hear um, people say, you know what, I believe in equality and I believe in human rights, but I don't want to get political. I don't feel comfortable getting political. And I would love to hear your thoughts on how we can make progress. Um, if, if you hear that from somebody, for example, you come up to me, we're talking about equality and I say, yeah, no, I believe in human rights, but I don't get, I don't like getting political. What is your response to that? How do we engage people who don't want to be political? Everything think, is political. I'm sorry, Jenna, go ahead. Yeah, I was gonna say the same thing, exactly. It's all political. And I think just looking at your community, like the direct community you are a part of will show you that there are bodies being harmed by these issues. It's not, you know, it's a matter of life and death wherever you look. So it is political inherently. Um, and I think your choice to stay silent is political too. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think politicians have made it seem like they're off doing something that we all don't have the either the knowledge, the edu I mean, the education or the position title to participate in, but we put them there and it's our job to hold them accountable. It's our job to be a part of the process. I mean, everything from what a girl can wear to school to whether or not she's over sexualized or whether or not she has jobs is all political. So you can't escape it. Definitely. And I think it's important to acknowledge that thinking that things aren't political, that um, your decisions aren't political is a privilege. It's because you aren't affected by these policies. And that means that you are complicit in the way that these policies, like Jana said, hurts people. You know, people are dying while they're waiting for you to stop being inactive. And I think that's so important to remember whenever we make choices with how we enact with policies. Um, you know, none of these communities asked for their existences to be politicized, but here we are. And so we must all do our parts and make sure that we can help and pull our weight, definitely. No, I, I, I wholeheartedly agree with that. And I'd even go a step further to say, it, not only is it um, a privilege to consider it apolitical um, because it doesn't impact you, but it's because it doesn't impact you negatively. You get the benefit of these policies. And I think that's pretty critical to recognize that whether you like it or not, you are either benefiting or you're losing. And it's your responsibility to, to look at where you are what you are gaining um, and, and recognize that it's your responsibility to, to step up, especially if you believe in human rights and equality and justice. Those just can't be buzzwords anymore. So we have five minutes and as we close up, I wanna make sure that you each get a chance to be speaking to government, corporation and individuals head on. So if you can, in a minute, maybe a minute and 20 seconds, um, give kind of your top line recommendation of what you want everybody listening to this to walk away from, what you want them to have heard, what you want them to go and actually employ in their own lives. And I will start with Jamira. Okay, come on, the most serious question of all serious questions, you turn to me first, Jesus. Um, I have to, I have to. Oh, the pressure. Um, I, I guess for anyone listening is, I wanna re return to a point that I made earlier, because I think 
you know, I've always, when I grew up, I grew up in a large family. I mean, I'm one of 16 children, very similar to Allah, who also comes from a very big family, is that, so I've always worked on the ideology that nothing that I do is solely impacting just me, right? It either impacts my, in my, my smaller family, my community, or my country. And so I think it's really important for all of us to recognize the privileges the, that we all hold dear um, are either negatively or positively impacting folks. And how can we think about our communities beyond ourselves to ensure that we're creating solutions that are one, helping to ensure the freedom, the prosperity and the evolution of folks to be able to live and thrive in their local communities and also ensure that we're not doing harm. Um, because I do believe that if we're gonna create collective impact, we have to have a collective responsibility to people that don't look like us and recognize that folks are are hurt, are harming, are being hurt right now, either through imprisonment, either through death, or either through oppression. And we all have a responsibility to stand up and speak on behalf of them when they're not, when they're not able to do so for themselves. And when they are, it's our responsibility to move out of the way and share power and space for them to tell their story. Hopefully that was right. <laughs> No, that was excellent. That was excellent. I would have, I would have like very subtly cut you off halfway through and like Jamira, can you give me a bit more uh, context there if I didn't think it was fantastic? So I know it was great. Feely? Yeah, definitely. Um, what Jamira has said has definitely resonated with me because um, coming from a Pacific Island being Samoan, we know that the village mentality is everything in our cultures um, and indigenous cultures, you know, nothing you do individually only affects you. There's always a ripple effect. And so I think that it's really important for governments, for CEOs to just not think about themselves, um, putting it as bluntly as possible. I don't want my homeland of Samoa to be sinking and dying before I do. Um, that is nothing no one wants. And actually acknowledging the weight of this and knowing that it shouldn't be put onto solely the shoulders of our youth. And that's such an important thing to acknowledge. Um, Although we are the futures of tomorrow, you still need to be making decisions today to ensure that our futures are safe and safeguarded. Um, and so I definitely feel like everyone needs to be really looking at themselves, their privileges, um, what they can do, how they can do it, and really thinking about the most vulnerable they see in their society, and most likely the most vulnerable that they don't see. Um, try to look for it, try to, try to please tap into those people and to make sure that you're being um, holding space. And I definitely think that's important that um, all people of color know where they stand in this and know um, what they are doing to be standing in solidarity with other communities because I think it all goes hand in hand. Um, yes, and to end off um, what I have to say, I'll say that the fact that we are alive and the fact that we have a voice means that we have a responsibility. And that's what I'd leave this on, yeah. And Jenna? Yeah, I wholeheartedly, wholeheartedly okay, agree with Jamira and Philly. Um, I think, you know, I grew up surrounded by powerful Egyptian women who are all driven, empowered, and impassioned. And I think that really taught me to use my voice and lift others up uh, because of that. And so I think my lasting message is really to actively and critically ask yourself questions about the impacts your actions are having on vulnerable communities around the world. Every minute um, on this earth, you know, there are people who are suffering and it is our responsibility um, to help them and also, you know, redirect conversations towards them. So that's really my lasting message. So I have to say, thank you all so much for being here today. Uh, Philippe, in particular, the 3.20 a.m. Um, energy is incredible. At 3.20 a.m., you could not get me to do this if you paid me a million dollars. To be super honest, I am sleeping. So thank you so much. I know you have exams this week. Jenna, Jamira, thank you. I think what we've heard from our panelists today is the importance of being accountable for your own actions. And one thing I will personally emphasize here um, is money. I mean that on a corporate level, I mean that on a government level, and I actually mean that on an individual level. Um, where you put your money often says what you value. And so if you are buying things that come from companies that have um, a supply chain that impacts the environment, if you are buying things um, that come from only particular communities or don't support, or from companies that don't support those communities, um, that's incredibly important. So where you invest your money as an individual is important, where you buy things from, who you buy things, buy local, buy from black owned businesses, buy from indigenous owned businesses, um, recognize that you do need to pay 
people if you are trying to get their expertise. Young, old, um, if, people are, if people are delivering expertise, that's something that you actually pay for. And for companies and governments, put your money into your actions. Uh, if, if it's, it's wonderful to say you believe in human rights, gender equality, um, listening to indigenous communities and climate change, but unless you're actively investing in it, it doesn't show up. We can't change anything if we're not changing how we're investing in it. So thank you all three of you so much for being here. Um, I genuinely appreciate it. I appreciate the expertise and the knowledge uh, and, and wish in other circumstances we could have been together. Um, but, but I think Zoom, Zoom was okay this time. Um, thank you all, have an awesome day. Thank you. <laughs>